Can you hear? Can you check the... Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay, uh, let's get started. The goal for today's class is to extend UCB type algorithms to general reinforcement learning problem. And it's not like we haven't studied general reinforcement learning problem. We have studied two specific problems, two specific algorithms to solve any finite state, finite action reinforcement learning. So, and that was Q learning and SARSA. So, okay, so in Q learning and SARSA, what was given? So, let me uh, rewrite the model. So, we have S is the state space. We have A is the action space. I'm going to talk in terms of reward because most of the recent reinforcement learning papers are in terms of reward. So R of S A is the reward. J mu is the, uh, or let me write it as J mu of T. It's the cost under policy mu. Uh, until time t. And what else do we need? Oh, and the transition probability. So P of S prime given S comma A. This is the transition kernel. Okay, so what was the Q learning algorithm? Well, QT plus one STAT is given by one minus beta T QT of SA plus beta T RT plus alpha, which was the discount factor max over A prime Q of ST plus one A prime. This is for S A equal to S T A T. And of course this one is Q T of S A otherwise. Okay, this was the famous Q learning algorithm for so the only thing I've changed is we have a reward here and we have a maximization here, okay? Oh, this should be QT. And given a sequence, S1, A1, R1, S2, A2, R2, and so on, as long as you are visiting all the state action pairs infinitely often, your QT would converge to Q star almost surely. Okay. Oh yeah, S and A. Yeah, that's right. S and A. Okay, so, so given a trajectory of state action reward, state, a state action reward, state action reward, we know that QT will converse to Q star almost surely as T goes to infinity. And this is a model free approach, which means that you don't need to know the reward function and you don't need to know the transition kernel. So as long as you have a device from which you can get this data, uh, the knowledge of reward function and transition kernel is not required. In fact, uh, you use this algorithm when you don't actually have the reward function as well as transition kernel. Okay? Now the question is, question for you is, 
Consider a situation where you don't know the reward function and the transition kernel. Can you do better than Q learning or SARSA? SARSA is also very similar in nature. So can you do better than Q learning or SARSA when you don't know the reward function and transition kernel? What's the main drawback of this algorithm? I have to use all actions. Uh, Sorry? I have to use all actions infinitely many times. Uh, so you have to use all the state action pairs. Um, yes. Any any other? You're updating only one state action entry at a time. Yes, so you're updating only one state action pairs at a time. OK, that's a very good drawback. Any other drawback? <clears throat> so let's consider. Uh, that this is 1900s, and if I give you state action, state action, state action, what's the first thing you will try to do? How large is what? The Sorry? How large is the state space? It doesn't matter how large the state space is. What, what's the first thing that you do? Any of you heard of system identification? Right? So you experiment with the system, you look at the state, you look at the excitation input that you're giving to the state, uh, to the system, and then you get all the state action, state action, state action, and then you try to build a model for that system, right? And sometimes the model could be simple because you use Newton's equations to figure out uh, force equal to mass into acceleration. So sometimes the, the overall dynamics could be very simple, sometimes the dynamics could be difficult. Okay, but that's the first thing that you try to do, which is to create a model. And in this particular situation, for some reason you're not creating a model even though you have the data available, right? So you're using the data just to learn the Q function, and then after infinite amount of time, so after a million years, your Q function seems to converge, and then you want to use that Q function for your decision and control task. But in some sense, you're not building a model uh, based on the data that is being given to you. So this uh, drawback was recognized in 2002, or somewhere around 2002, that we need to build a model and do better than Q learning. So need to estimate a model and do better than Q learning. Okay, and this was, I think, Kearns and Singh, 2002. That's the first paper which tried to, uh, which tried to build a model and come up with finite time regret bound for Q learning algorithm. <clears throat> and if you have seen the handout, that's the E cube algorithm, E cube algorithm. And then a much better version of the algorithm is UCRL2 algorithm. This was proposed in 2010. And it, it builds upon all this whole um, uh, body of research that was done both in multi arm bandit as well as reinforcement learning literature. Okay. All right, so so what to, so so let's let's go back to the discussion about multi-arm bandit problems. So in multi-arm bandit problems, we were interested in average reward, and we used the data. There was no concept of state transition, so we didn't have to really think about transition kernel because states were IID, and all we were interested in is the av was the average reward. So we kept track of the average reward from each arm over long periods of time and used that to drive the decision rule or the algorithm, the learning algorithm. Okay. Now there are two things to learn. One is the reward, the other one is transition kernel. Okay. So how, do you, how would you learn the transition kernel? Well, you have S1, A1, S2 pair, S2, A2, S3 pair, and so on and so forth. 
you can do the averaging, the same trick that we had done for computing the average reward, we can do the same thing to compute the transition kernel. Um, and then you know R1, which is our expected value of, no, R1, which is R of S1, A1, R2 is R of S2, A2, and so on. So you can also get an estimate of the reward at every state action pair. Okay, so that's the key idea. That's what I mean by estimating a model. So you want to estimate r hat and p hat at time t and use that to drive your decision rule. <clears throat> okay, so overall the just of the class of algorithms designed in this particular space has the following three steps. One is use past data. So it could be epoch based, in which case you will follow these steps within each epoch, or it could be non epoch based, in which case you will. Uh, actually, the eCube algorithm as well as UCRL3, these are all epoch based algorithms. So let me just write in each epoch. I'm not sure if there are any non-epoch based algorithm in this space. Uh, so let's just consider epoch based. So in each epoch, use past data to estimate r hat and p hat design a policy mu hat Um, which carefully balances exploration versus exploitation trade-off. Third, execute policy mu hat until a stopping time is reached. Okay, so now the first step is uh, pretty straightforward. I don't think it needs much explanation. Uh, what would you do for the second case, the so second step, which is to design a policy, uh, mu hat, which would balance exploration versus exploitation. So what was the, what was the idea in, in, uh, in the context of um, the bandit algorithms. How did we design a policy which carefully balances exploration versus exploitation? What was the key idea there? Bump up the mean, right? So the policy mu hat was constructed by bumping up the mean which balances the exploration versus exploitation trade-off. Okay. Um, so we'll do a similar thing in the context of um, reinforcement learning algorithm as well. So there are two things we could do. So now we have two axes to worry about. So one is the P axis, the other one is the R axis, the reward axis. And for whatever, using the past data, 
I know that I stand here, which is p hat slash r hat. I'm going to design a confidence region around p hats comma r hat. And I want to estimate, design a policy mu, mu hat for some MDP, which is within this particular region, okay? Now the third step is also clear. You execute the policy mu hat until some, something happens. So until you have visited all state action pairs or until you have visited all state action pairs a certain number of times. Um, and then you go back to the next epoch and then go over the steps again and again. Okay, so at every, in every epoch you collect some data. So your estimates r hat and p hat becomes better and better as you move from one epoch to another because now you have way more data to come up with a better estimate of r hat and p hat. And we know from chernoff hoevding bound that the more data you have, the probability of not being within the confidence interval goes down significantly, okay? So it goes down exponentially with more data. So therefore, more data implies better estimate and therefore your policy mu hat would get closer and closer to mu star, which is the optimal policy for the MDP. Okay, so that's the general algorithm. Any questions about that? Yes. How do you really automate uh, the R hat and P hat? Oh, um, all right. So, good question. So, R hat of S comma A would be summation. Let's say tau is equal to 1 to t. So let's say I want to estimate it at time t. So tau equals to 1 to t rt indicator st equals to s and at equals to a. Oh, and then I have to divide it by summation indicator st equals to s, at equals to a. No, S tau, sorry, tau. Okay, makes sense, yeah. So how do we initialize? Perhaps you will initialize with zero or something. So we are going to make some assumption on the structure of the MDP so that you visit all these state action pairs. Basically, we'll assume unichain MDP. So that way you know from every state, you will go to every state. And your exploration scheme will make sure that you have visited all the actions at every state. Yeah. Is that the required condition for this algorithm? Uh, yes, that's the required condition for both the algorithms. We are looking at the average cost case problem, okay? Yes. Um, if we do not know the, uh, the reward and the transition probability, um, it makes sense to me that we need to explore because we right. now find out the Correct. optimal policy. Correct. If we know those two things, why don't we use like an optimal control or optimization problem just solve for the, what, what's uh, the motivation of doing exploration rather than just solving optimization problem? So I, I didn't get your question. So you, why do you want to do exploration or why do you want to do? Why do we want to do exploration since we can just solve that uh, okay. problem? Right, right. So why did we need to do exploration in the multi-arm bandit case? I think that's partially because we do not know the reward and right. the transition. Well, there was no transition there, so, but the reward was a random variable and we wanted to know the mean of the reward. And uh, the estimate of the mean based on the empirical estimate, based on the data you have received, uh, it becomes better and better as you collect more and more data for that particular arm. That was the idea in the, in the case of uh, multi-arm bandit. And it's the same thing in, uh, in this situation as well. So the more data you have for each state action pair, the more confident you are that your actual reward is 
equal to this r hat t. Okay, remember the Chernoff Hoefding bound. So the probability that the mean that the sum over well empirical mean minus the true mean m greater than t is less than or equal to two exponential minus t. Oh, this should be f delta. Anyone remembers what was the bound? T delta over two, de two sigma square, right? Sigma is the sub Gaussian parameter. The, was it? Was there a delta square? No, it was like this. Okay. So this was the. This is the confidence you have. So x hat t is your current empirical mean. This is the true mean, and it will be far away uh, if with probability exponential of minus t delta square over 2 sigma square. So delta square is constant. That's our confidence bound. Sigma square is constant for a given distribution. So t is the only thing that varies. So the more data you have, the more data you collect, the better your confidence bound is going to be. Because this term goes to 0 as t goes to infinity, but it goes to 0 exponentially fast because t is in the exponential, exponential term. We could just use the optimal policy based on the, the reward and the transition matrix. Yes, the yes, curve. but you don't know the transition matrix, right? So you estimate it, but you don't know whether that is the true transition matrix or not. Okay, so what's, what's happening? So this is the estimate at, say, time t, but your true p and r would be sitting here. So if you are optimal for this, you need not be optimal for this. So the more data you collect, you can get closer and closer to this estimate and eventually become optimal for p comma r. Um, if we do not do the exploration, just use the policy yes. that we get from the non-optimal or incorrect um, matrix um, and collect more data, can we eventually converge to the... Yes. Yes, that's what their, their main result is. That's what the main result of these two algorithms is. That if you follow these algorithms, eventually you will converge to the optimal policy. There was another hand, yeah. So, so like in the step two, uh, we are still trying to uh, update uh, our hat and PM. No, we are not. Then why you need to explore? So, uh, so you want to pick a policy mu hat so that the data you will collect in step three will improve your estimate in the next epoch. Okay, so it's a cycle. Of course, what happens in first epoch is completely useless. So in first epoch, you basically just, uh, you are completely in the exploration mode because you don't really know what the states are and what the actions are in that MDP. Okay. Now, of course, uh, one thing you will notice is that this particular step, step two, is the one that takes, uh, mac it, it's a much more computationally intensive activity, okay? So the way we will design a policy is either by running a dynamic program for a certain number of time steps or running a, a relative value iteration for a certain number of time steps or do a bit more complex relative value iteration based on the confidence interval uh, for computing the policy mu hat. So this particular step is way more computationally challenging in comparison to the Q learning algorithm where we didn't have step one. All we did was we have a policy, we observe state action reward tuples, and then we just use that to update the Q function. So that particular algorithm, Q learning algorithm, was extremely efficient in terms of execution but it wasn't really, it was just uh, removing the past data from the memory. And we don't want to do that. We want to use the past data to have a better estimate of what MDP we are solving and then uh, get a better regret bound in the end. Now, what's the regret? So this is the way to compute r hat t. Similarly, p hat t s prime given s a. <coughs> 
will be computed. Let me let me call this term. This term will be called n n t s a. So number of times you have uh, visited state action pair s a until time t. So my p hat t s prime given s a will be n t s a s prime over n t s a. <clears throat> so this is the number of times you have visited S A S prime tuple and the number of times you have visited S A tuple. Any questions? Okay. algorithm or E cube algorithm. Let's look at the algorithm. Okay, well, before we look at the algorithm, let me try to uh, explain some of the terms that are used in the algorithm. So the first thing is a known state. So they, the algorithm divides the state space So this is my state, so this is finite action state space. Okay, so this is my state space. I'm going to define, divide the state space into three regions. So one is known states. And then visited but unknown states. and then unknown states. No, just the state space as S. So everything is finite. S is finite. A is finite. Okay, what do you think these words mean? So known states, these are the states which I have visited several times in the past and for which I have enough exploration data. So I've tried almost all the actions a certain number of times. So I have pretty good confidence about the p hat and the r hat that I've seen from that particular states is uh, very accurate description of the reality. Visited but unknown states are the states that you have visited maybe only five, six times. Okay, so you don't quite have a lot of data from those states. So you have visited them, which means you know that such a state exists, but you just don't know, don't have enough samples from that particular state um, to have a good confidence about p hat t and r hat t at those state action pairs. Unknown states are the ones that you have not visited so far, so you don't even know whether they exist or they don't exist, okay? So those are the three broad uh, categories of state space in the E cube algorithm. Now, whenever you get to any of these states, they say 
they come up with what is known as, well, they don't come up with, uh, uh, they define what is known as balanced exploration, which means that at state S, pick action that has not been picked, that has been picked minimum number of times. If you have five actions and you have picked action one only five times, but action two, three, four, and five have been picked 20 times, then every time you visit state S, you will pick action one, again you will pick action one, again you will pick action one, until all the actions or state action pairs for the known states well. Until for that state you have visited all the actions a certain number of times. Okay, so that's known as balanced exploration. Once you have, once for a state you have done a balanced exploration certain number of times, which means that you have visited that state action pair maybe 20 times or 30 times, then that state is put into the known states category, and then rest of the states that you have visited will be put in this category. Unknown states are unknown states, so you don't even know if they exist or they don't exist. Okay. All right, so, so let's look at the E-cube algorithm now, okay? So let's say they initialize with all the states S is, so the number of known states is empty, you have, everything is unknown. Now, anytime the current state is not in S, the algorithm performs balanced wandering or balanced exploration. Um, let me write it as balanced wandering. So if you're if you're not in a known state, you do a balanced wandering. Now anytime you visit an unknown state, then it becomes a visited but unknown states. <clears throat> um, any time state i has been visited m underscore known times during the balanced wandering, it enters the known set s and no longer participates in balanced wandering, okay? So if you have visited certain state m underscore known times, it gets into the known state category. Now, there is some observation that you sort of use to compute r hat t and p hat t and so on. <clears throat> then you do some offline optimization in order to design a policy, mu hat, which will carefully balance exploration and exploitation trade-off. So one of the things that they do is solve the MDP m hat t, p hat t, uh, with an augmented state S naught, with an augmented terminal state S naught. What do you mean by solving the MDP? So they solve, they compute optimal policy for T time steps.
this is the offline computation part and giving you the actual algorithm will take me a lot of time so i'm not going to give you the actual details of what they mean by uh, offline computation offline optimization i certainly refer you to the paper to look at what the offline optimization is but i'm going to give you a high level idea of what they are trying to do okay so here is what they do in that mdp so they define an mdp where all the known states have this should be r hat so all the known states have r hat t and p hat t computed they combine all the visited but unknown states and unknown states into this terminal state s not okay and they extend the notion of reward and the uh, probability distribution uh, in a very specific way which will balance the exploration versus exploitation trade off okay and that's the part which is a bit more complicated to introduce and that's why i'm not introducing the exact value of r hat t and p hat t for this with this augmented terminal state now the way they solve it is they compute the optimal policy for t time steps and then use the optimal policy at time at this entire t time steps uh, as the policy mu hat which they will use for the next t capital t time steps okay so that's the um, attempted exploitation attempted exploration and then balanced wandering condition that you see in the offline optimization and then um, and and that's their e cube algorithm and then they do the analysis for e cube algorithm about what the regret bounds are which is extremely complicated analysis so that's why i don't want to cover it in the class um the important thing is to for you to tell me what should this capital t time steps be how should i decide what the time step capital t should be um so that i run the algorithm for t time steps how large should this capital time t be yes you have some thoughts no no is there a threshold on the number of times that uh, action should be tested for each state right sorry what what there is a threshold on number of times it's it, it, every action should be tested for each state right yes yes so t i think t should be like multiplication between this threshold is the number of action is number of states okay that's a good point so he's saying that t should be capital t should be some function of the number of states and number of actions okay so that's his idea uh let's consider an mdp in which there are multiple states but only one action at every state so this mdp basically you have 0 1 2 or maybe i should start from 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 and the action is move one step forward and then when you reach the final step you move back to state 1 okay so this is my mdp is there something problematic about this mdp what are you trying to optimize sorry <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying to well yeah okay what are you trying to optimize uh okay uh okay let me add a few more transitions in this <laughs> okay now there is some optimization going on <laughs> uh well what i want to get to is the following fact 
that depending on the transition kernel of the MDP, of the, tr tr the true transition kernel of the MDP, you will have some going from, so going from one state to another state may take a certain number of time steps, okay? So an MDP would be completely mixing if you can go from any state to any other state within one or two or three time steps, in which case you can reach any state very quickly from any starting state. But in this particular MDP, um, if you want to go from two to one, you have to spend a lot of time roaming around before you can reach the state one, if you start from state two, okay? So this idea, this notion of how many times it takes before you go from one state to another is captured by several different variables in the context of MDPs. So one is mixing time. The second is uh, epsilon return mixing time. And the third one is diameter of MDP. Okay, so all these three things capture how many steps needed to go from one state to another. write it as epsilon mixing time. Okay, so for the E cube algorithm, capital T is taken to be epsilon over two mixing time for this MDP. So what are these various quantities? So let pi 0, pi 1, pi t be the distribution over states under transition p mu. and pi star be the invariant distribution. <clears throat> this is the invariant distribution. Then uh, epsilon mixing time is defined as inf t such that pi t minus pi star is less than epsilon. Now this norm could be any norm that may be of interest. Usually it's total variation norm uh, for Markov chains, but it could be anything else. 
It could be KL divergence. It could be some other norm on uh, the space of measures, or it could be total variation norm, which is more common to study. Okay, so what's the notion of epsilon mixing time? Well, epsilon mixing mixing time refers to so you are you are you have a invariant distribution for the Markov chain under the policy mu. So of course the epsilon mixing time depends on what policy you pick. So if you have a class of policies, then you look at the maximum of all mixing times uh, to get the mixing time for the MDP. So for every policy, you have an invariant distribution. You have the sequence of distribution that uh, tells you what the distribution over the state space is under the transition kernel P mu. The usual transition structure is pi t plus 1 equals to pi t multiplied by P mu. And how quickly it converges to the steady state distribution or the invariant distribution depends on the second largest eigenvalue of P mu. Usually, the largest eigenvalue is equal to 1. And not usually. The largest eigenvalue is equal to 1. But the second largest eigenvalue de determines how quickly the MDP is going to reach the steady state distribution. And so that determines. So if your second largest eigenvalue is small, your mixing time is going to be very small. And therefore, you will have to compute the optimal policy for very few number of time steps. On the other hand, if your mixing time is very large, uh, sorry, if your second eigenvalue is very large, second largest eigenvalue, your mixing time is going to be very large, in which case you will compute the optimal policy for a very large number of time steps. And the idea is, so of course, mixing time tells you how quickly you visit from one state to another. So the idea is, in this particular dynamic programming algorithm is that you should be able to visit from any initial state to any other state uh, within the epoch, within the length of that epoch, which is capital T time steps. Okay. So this is your E cube algorithm. Any questions about the E cube algorithm? Oh, unknown states, yes. So eventually unknown states will become empty because you have picked your t to be sufficiently large. So this t, the epsilon mixing time of the MDP is supposed to be given as input to the algorithm, E cube algorithm. Okay, and that's another problem with this algorithm because you're asking for information that depends on the transition kernel, but you don't know the transition kernel itself. Yeah. So you have to have some additional information about the underlying structure of the MDP to be able to give this as input to the MDP. OK? So this is only to ensure that you don't have any unknown state at the end of yes. each of Yes. Or at least you will discover some new states, or you would visit some, some states in this category, and therefore you will be able to explore some actions that you may not have explored. OK. But this, this subsection, like visit but not unknown, cannot be vanished, right? Cannot be? Cannot be vanished. Or... Uh, so eventually, so the goal of this whole algorithm is initially this is empty and everything is in the unknown states. Then <coughs> you visit some states, it gets into this category. Then you visit them more often, it gets into the known states category. right? So there is a flow of states from unknown states to visited but unknown states to known states. Sorry? What, what, what would be the case if we have like transient states? Uh -huh. Oh, yes, yes. So that's a good this point. Case, in this case, this, this states will not never go to the. No, you can. So transient states can still be visited several times if you start from the transient category. If you initialize your MDP with the state in the transient category. But you. So all these algorithms are designed for unichain where you may not have transient states for the average cost problems. Okay. 
You, you see what I'm saying? So. But in the unit chain condition, we, we may have transit states. Yes. And one, one unit chain. Correct. One un, yeah, one communicating set of states. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So yeah. So I, my understanding of this particular paper, the algorithm is that they don't allow any transient states to be within the MDP. Because you will not really visit transient states many times if you go through their algorithm. Um, yeah. Suppose if you have a unichain with some transient states, yeah. then uh, is mixing time dependent on which state you start from, or is it independent? No, so in mix, yeah, so the, the, for transient state, the pi star will be zero. So, you know, eventually pi t will also be zero as t becomes close to the mixing time. Okay. Oh, the epsilon return mixing time is defined as follows. So this explicitly takes into account the uh, the return with respect to sorry j mu infinity. So this takes into account how quickly you converse to the steady state cost function, steady state expected cost or expected reward um, as as a function of time. Okay. So this is your epsilon return. So somehow this return means the, the expected reward that you are planning to get, or the expected reward you get until time t. So that's what is epsilon return mixing time. And what is the third thing, diameter? This is the time it takes to go from S to S prime under policy mu. Yes. So going back to having transient states. Yes. Suppose if we, uh, at, the, at the beginning of each epoch, we start with some state which is not visited. Correct. Then the only problem is if we start from recurring states, we may not visit the transient states. At all. Yes, yes, but yes. But if we, at each uh, beginning of each epoch, you pick some state from the unknown state, then you would have covered all the transient states. Right? No, you cannot cover all transient states because it depends really on the transition kernel of the MDP. But you still know the unknown states, right, if it's not visited at all. So in this, in this algorithm, you don't know what are the unknown states. Because you have not visited them, they are not part of your state space description at, every, at the point of time until you actually visit it. So consider a chessboard. And the state is all possible configurations of the chessboard. If you have never seen a possible configuration, how do you know that that configuration can exist during a play of a chess? Right? So that's the, that's the problem with unknown states. Yes? Um, do, does the state enter the known state only because it has been visited or? It has been visited several times. Does it consider 
if certain action has been executed. So whenever you are in this situation, whenever you have a visited state, but they are still considered unknown, you do a balance wandering, which is you always pick an action that has not been that has been picked minimum number of times at that particular state. Okay, so what happens is if you visit a state, if you visit a state 500 times and you have 10 actions, then it means that you have picked 50 actions for that particular state. So, so it means that um, when you visit a state 500 times, then that becomes a known state. Okay, so 500 is the parameter m underscore known in point number three in the e cube algorithm. So you see any time a state i has been visited m underscore known times, so that m underscore known is a number that tells you if you have visited that state 500 times, then it becomes a known state because you have explored all the actions at that particular state. Yes. That's right, yeah. So there is a lot of computation that you need to do, which is figure out which of the states are known, which of them are not unknown. Then for unknown states, you have to do the, well, visited but unknown states, you have to do balance wandering. And then for rest of the states, you have to solve this MDP to figure out what you need to do. So it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated algorithm which basically tells you why uh, Q-learning is so simple to implement, but if you want to make use of all the data that you have seen in the past, it becomes very difficult to, <coughs> to be able to solve that problem because you have to keep track of a lot of things and you have to design the policy using some sort of dynamic programming algorithm uh, with the number of time steps t that depends on the epsilon mixing time of that particular algorithm. So. A lot of complicated stuff going on. Yes. Uh, you said that the mixing time has to be provided as an input. As an input to the algorithm, so because it's needed estimate? needed for this step. How do we estimate it when we don't know anything about the MDP? That I don't know. So as a theory paper, they can make whatever assumptions they want to make. <laughs> uh, so you work on NLP problems, right? So. I don't even know whether a mixing time would exist in an NLP problem. So is there a state that you visit very often or? I don't know. I, I mean, I, really, for the NLP problems that you may be looking at, I don't even know how you would compute the mixing time because it's such a huge state space that there is no possible way of knowing what the mixing time would be. OK. Let's talk about UCRL2 algorithm now. This published in 2010, and that's the back of the sheet. So uh, so in UCRL2 algorithm, um, they are, they have the following Okay, so the first step, which is to estimate r hat and mu hat, sorry, p hat, that has been done. You can look at the algorithm. So in episode k, you initialize and you compute p k and r k, which are the r hat and p hat that we have been talking about on in the class. Now the next part comes, how do you compute the policy? And their solution is the following you define r tilde s a equals to r hat s a plus square root of seven 
log 2SA TK over delta over 2 max 1 NKSA. Okay, so they bump up the reward. So this is the empirical reward, empirical mean reward at state action pair SA that you have seen so far. You bump it up with logarithmic of time over the number of times you have visited that state action pair. Very similar to UCB algorithm, okay? Now P tilde S prime given SA, this actually is a bit more complicated. So description is complicated, refer to the paper. But of course the term that you are seeing, square root of 14, S, log, blah, blah, blah. So that particular term enters in the description for P tilde S prime given S A. So this is at the end of kth epoch, so this is Okay, so their algorithm for computing the, they define what is known as extended value iteration for computing the policy that needs to be used. So extended value iteration is as follows. So this is a V zero is equal to zero and V i s is equal to max over a r tilde s a plus max over p tilde in some set capital P of summation p tilde s prime given s a multiplied by V, V i minus one S. Okay, so in this particular algorithm you have, this is the usual dynamic programming step, but in the middle, now you have a max over P tilde in P where this P is P is equal to the set of P such that P minus P hat is less than equal to square root of 14 S capital S log 2 A T K over delta over max 1 N K S A. So as again, uh, it's a bit uh, complicated to execute, but they have a faster algorithm that can do this maximization pretty quickly. 
uh, in polynomial time, that's what I mean by quickly, and it can run the extended value iteration to give you the mu hat. What is A here? A is the number of actions, S is the number of number of states. Sorry? 14, 1, 4. Okay, so let me write it, fast algorithm to compute, to execute extended value iteration. It's there in the paper, so you can take a look at it. Now, how long do you run this algorithm? So you look at the span of vi plus one minus vi, and it should be less than equal to one over square root of tk. So run until run evi. Whatever policy you get at the end, that becomes your policy to execute over the next epoch until you reach epoch k plus one. Okay, so these are all under the assumption that you, are, you have a unichain MDP with no transient states, so all the states can be visited and the diameter appears in the regret bound for the MDP, for the final result. In fact, let me just write what the algorithm's regret bound is. Oh, there it is. Regret at time t is bounded by 34. T, d is the diameter. <clears throat> That's the regret bound for this particular algorithm. UCRL2 algorithm. Now, Q learning re learns asymptotically. Uh, it, we don't know what the regret bound for Q learning is. Perhaps somebody has computed it, but we don't, uh, I, mean, I don't know about it. But for this case, you see that the regret is sublinear. In t uh, so <coughs> regret grows as square root of t log t. So definitely it's sublinear, and therefore the average regret over a long period of time is going to be zero, which means that you're learning the optimal policy at a faster rate than any other random algorithm. Okay, so that's all I have. So these are the two, well, there are many algorithms for, um, for solving MDPs where you keep track of the R hat and T, P hat. Um, so EQ being the first algorithm that was designed, okay, so it's necessarily very complicated. And UCRL2, which was designed on the Line, along the lines of UCB algorithm, uh, which is somewhat simpler, but still needs a little bit of work to prove the regret bound. And then there are other algorithms. So there is UCRL, UCRL algorithm, and then there, are, there is some other algorithm, again, uh, proposed in 2002 that also works for zero-sum games, adversarial settings. So a whole bunch of algorithms that can keep track of the model and give you um, a good regret bound. What I do not know is if your MDP is parameterized by theta and you have some prior belief over theta, is there a Bayesian um, setting 
for MDPs. So for instance, you remember last time we talked about Thomson sampling, which allowed you to estimate the value of theta, and based on that, you explore, you come up with the exploration scheme. Or we talked about information-directed sampling, or we talked about a maximum biased maximum likelihood estimator. So the extensions of those algorithms for the MDP setting perhaps has not been done. So those are the open problems at this point of time. Now, if you have a physical system, you have a car, you have a powertrain, you have a, a, a robot, it is quite likely that your transition kernel is parameterized by theta. Okay, so this would be parameterized by theta. And instead of trying to estimate the whole transition kernel using UCRL2 algorithm, it's better off you estimate theta based on the prior and then use that for computing your optimal sequence of strategies. Now, the reason why I say that is suppose you have a robotic arm. You can write the entire kinematic equation for the robotic arm. The only problem is because of the manufacturing defect, the length of the arm, okay, the length of these arms are going to be different, and that's the unknown parameter theta that, would, that you would like to know based on the state and action and reward that you have received from the system. Or if you have uh, semiconductor devices based on the uh, faults in the manufacturing, at the time of manufacturing, theta would encode what all faults might have occurred, and therefore, what are the S, A, S prime pair that you are likely to see in that particular system. So you can actually use uh, some prior knowledge or some physical knowledge that you have about the device to parameterize theta, and then instead of estimating the whole transition kernel, you just estimate theta. So that part, and, and then the question is, how do you explore, and how do you exploit all the information that you have received so those class of algorithms is something that's very interesting to come up with and has not been done. The other thing that has not been done is what happens if you have two data streams. So this is about one data stream. You have S, A, S prime, and R tuple uh, coming to you. But what happens if you have two simulation devices giving you S, A, S prime, and R? So this class of algorithms is not taking into account the fact that you could have multiple data streams coming from multiple sources. So perhaps that's also an interesting extension for algorithms of this type. Okay, so that's all I have, and I'll see you guys on on Thursday. So on Thursday onwards, we are going to do continuous state, continuous action MDPs. Okay, and then after break, I'm going to talk about universal function approximation theorems, which is very useful for both machine learning and reinforcement learning. So we'll see you on Thursday. Yeah. About the EQ algorithm. Yes.